Hey there everybody and welcome to this presentation on treatment strategies for depressive disorders. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this video, we're going to explore current evidence-based practices for the treatment of depressive disorders. Now you may be asking, what are evidence-based practices? These are interventions that have been studied in the research and have shown positive effects for treating depression or depressive symptoms across multiple studies and across many, many, many people. It's not just a case study. It's not just a theory. These are things that have been shown to be effective with people. Why is this important? Well, unfortunately, the research also shows that less than 50% of people actually achieve full symptom remission with typical antidepressants or psychotherapy. Now, if you combine antidepressants and psychotherapy, we get up over the 60% mark, but not very far over the 60% mark, which means we've got 40% of the people who are still experiencing significant symptoms. This underscores the importance of recognizing depression as a biopsychosocial issue. When people are depressed, it affects them physically. It affects them emotionally. It affects them cognitively. It affects their relationships. And if we don't address all of the factors that are contributing to their depression or maintaining their depression, we're probably not going to help them achieve their highest quality of life. So let's start out with physical interventions and in graduate school in counseling, we really don't talk about this enough, if at all. And the research is undeniable that people who get poor quality sleep, who get insufficient quality sleep are at a much higher risk of developing mood disorders, including depression. So helping people look at their sleep hygiene. Are they doing everything they can to ensure that they are getting sufficient quality sleep? And I've got several videos on the YouTube channel that talk about uh, sleep hygiene and uh, the importance of sleep and circadian rhythms for managing mood disorders and even preventing mood disorders. Some people may need a sleep study if they're not sure if they're getting quality sleep or they wait, awaken and they don't feel refreshed ever, uh, they may go to their doctor and be referred for a sleep study to see kind of what's going on when they're actually asleep. Another cause of poor sleep that just absolutely needs to be addressed is obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea or OSA is when people regularly stop breathing when they're asleep and that wakes them up. Every time they stop breathing, they will like snort or gag or whatever word you want to use. If you've heard somebody with OSA, you know what it sounds like because they, they are really loud snorers. But every time they stop breathing, they wake up a little bit and then they go back to sleep. They may not recognize, they may not realize that they're waking up, but they are, and that is disrupting their sleep significantly. One of the first interventions I use with people, um, or I suggest to people, is to get their sleep and their circadian rhythms in sync. And each one of the hyperlinks throughout this presentation does take you to uh, the studies in PubMed that describe exactly why this works or the studies that have been done that show it works. Another physical intervention for depression is pain management. When people are in pain, guess what? It impacts their sleep. But aside from that, when people are in pain, they can start to feel helpless and hopeless. They can feel frustrated because they're always in pain. There is a strong correlation between pain and depression, especially chronic pain. 
there's also a strong correlation between inflammation and pain and inflammation and depression helping people get their pain and inflammation under control is another essential aspect of physiological recovery when people are depressed as serotonin goes goes down uh, we see that their pain tolerance also goes down so people who are depressed actually experience more pain as a result of their depression doesn't that suck so we want to help them figure out what they can do to mitigate that pain as much as possible and there are a lot of non-pharmacological interventions that can be used that can be very helpful like massage and tens units and yoga and acupuncture um, so it's important that they go see their doctor if they've got chronic pain cardiovascular disease is another issue that can contribute to depression in a lot of people and this includes hypertension um, copd heart disease anything that affects the body's ability to transport oxygen around to transport blood around falls under that cardiovascular disease umbrella and when the body is not fully and adequately oxygenated and nourished it leads it causes stress causes the hpa axis to be triggered and contributes to feelings of fatigue and irritability and generally also negatively impacts sleep many people will not have cardiovascular disease and depression that you see they may just present with depression but if they do have cardiovascular disease it's important that that is addressed hormones testosterone estrogen progesterone etc all of those gonadal hormones and thyroid hormones when those are out of whack they contribute to mood issues too little often contributes to depression and too much often contributes to anxiety and anger but it really depends on the hormone any of these things can be addressed can be noted in a annual physical people can go to their doctor and most insurance companies cover your annual physical so going in for that annual physical as a preventative or a wellness check is generally doesn't cost people anything and during that visit the doctor will run blood panels urine screens etc in order to make sure the person's body is functioning as well as possible and during that wellness visit is a great time to talk with the doctor about sleep problems or pain problems nutrition is another aspect that is so important in recovery from depression now as mental health clinicians as social workers we are not registered dietitians we cannot prescribe a menu we cannot prescribe a diet we can educate people about the importance of good nutrition and about the impact of inflammatory foods but if they need help designing a menu plan or figuring out what to eat they definitely need to uh, consult with their doctor or a registered dietitian that being said there was uh, there are a lot of studies that show the connection between uh, poor nutrition and mood issues why is that remember what we eat becomes the building blocks to make the hormones and the neurotransmitters and the tissues and everything else that our body needs to make in order to help us stay to stay functioning it's the raw materials so if we put crappy raw materials in then we may get crappy results out uh, so it is important to remember that now your neurotransmitters for example are made from amino acids from proteins that you eat but you can't just eat proteins and expect your body to do it the chemical reactions that break down the the amino acids to make them into neurotransmitters also require the whole spectrum of vitamins and minerals which is why you need to eat a good well-rounded diet it doesn't have to be you know super duper you know health conscious but you know reasonable 
Anyhow, one of the studies that I looked at uh, was a meta-analysis of 11 other studies that contained a total of 101,950 participants. And it suggested that those on a pro-inflammatory diet, which is what we typically think of as the American diet, have a 140% increased likelihood, let that sink in, a 140% increased likelihood of being diagnosed with depression or displaying depressive symptoms. People who eat refined carbohydrates, white bread, um, simple sugars, those sorts of things, really highly processed foods, saturated fats, trans fats, lots of omega-6s, not many omega-3s, red meat and or processed meat like hot dogs and things that have nitrates and nitrites in them are eating what we call a pro-inflammatory diet. All of these foods can contribute to inflammation. Now I have sugars starred with a little asterisk here. Typically, we think of sugars as sucrose, you know, your, your white sugar that goes into white bread that you may put in your coffee, those sorts of things. But it also includes other sugars like fructose. Fructose is your fruit sugar. And I'm going to talk in a minute about making sure to eat anti-inflammatory foods. But, and, and a lot of your fruits are anti-inflammatory in nature. And when you eat them whole, you eat whole apples, cherries, peaches, nectarines, whatever it is that you want to eat, uh, there is fiber that helps buffer the impact of the fructose. So eating actual whole fruits and vegetables helps the body acquire antioxidants and which help reduce inflammation. And that, that, that fiber buffers the impact of the sugar, so it's less inflammatory. Um, it is important to eat a variety of colorful foods and vegetables. The darker the color, the more powerful it is at reducing inflammation. And, and so just kind of use that as a general rule when you're selecting vitamin or when you're selecting fruits and vegetables something like iceberg lettuce this kind of a pale green has a lot less antioxidant and anti-inflammatory impact than something like spinach or kale or even romaine lettuce that is really dark in color it is important because remember i said in order to break down the amino acids from their food form into something the body can use, you need the entire spectrum of vitamins and minerals. Your doctor, when they do your blood test, will be testing for um, iron deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, any of those deficiencies, uh, and, and can help you identify ways to remediate those. Interestingly, there are a lot of vitamin D receptors in the same area of the brain that is associated with mood. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that they started exploring the connection between vitamin D deficiency and depressive symptoms. The take home from this slide, good nutrition is important. Uh, lots of vegetables, um, a few fruits, and trying to avoid as much as possible uh, red meat and processed meat and minimizing your omega-6s. Again, I have a, several videos on the YouTube channel on nutrition for mental health that go into great detail about all of this stuff. Exercise. Now I know that's a bad word for a lot of people, but exercise just means moving your body. Get up off the chair. It doesn't necessarily mean going to the gym. Exercise and antidepressant medication may, may alleviate depression through common mechanisms, including increased neurogenesis and expression of neurotrophic factors, increased availability of serotonin and norepinephrine, regulation of HPA axis activity, and reduced inflammatory signals. So let's go through each of those. Both exercise and antidepressants, you don't have to have them together, 
separate or together, um, both interventions increase what they call neurogenesis. It increases the rate at which your body uh, replaces neurons in your brain. And they found a significant correlation between a reduction in neurogenesis and an increase in depression. So when we increase neurogenesis, depression generally goes down. Obviously your antidepressants are typically going to increase serotonin and norepinephrine, but interestingly, exercise does as well. And it doesn't have to be intense exercise in your target heart rate range or anything crazy like that. Uh, it can be just mild walking, um, cleaning the house vigorously, gardening, anything that moves your body that you enjoy doing. Exercise and antidepressants also both regulate HPA axis activity. They found that low intensity exercise, like a gentle walk, can actually reduce cortisol levels, and cortisol is your stress hormone, and improve mood. Uh, so again, we're going back to you don't have to kill yourself at the gym to get the benefits from exercise. And the part that I found most interesting was they, antidepressants reduce inflammatory signals, but so does exercise. Obviously, if you exercise too much, too hard, you're breaking down a lot of muscle tissue, you're going to have some inflammation and pain. But easy exercise often reduces inflammatory signals throughout the body, partly because it helps uh, increase circulation, increase hydration, and get rid of some of that oxidative stress. It gets rid of some of the, the byproducts of uh, your body's functioning every day. And those byproducts contribute to inflammation. So the faster we can get them out of the system, the less inflammation or less problems they can cause. And finally, and this is one of the newer interventions that I think is really interesting, vagus nerve stimulation has also been found to significantly impact mood. Your vagus nerve is mostly responsible for triggering the rest and digest response as opposed to the fight or flee response. So the vagus nerve goes from top of your head, all the way down through all your organs, it connects just about everything. And when the vagus nerve is not activated, if it's not activating enough, if it's being overruled by the fight or flight response, uh, then people can feel a lot of anger, anxiety, and eventually, if that goes unchecked, depression. Vagus nerve stimulation, getting the body trained, if you will, to more effectively activate that vagus nerve can help people buffer against stress so they don't have the long-term impact or long-term unchecked anxiety and stress that can lead to depression. Medications. The physical aspect wouldn't be complete without discussing medications. Now, medications are not for everybody. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to be on them. By all means, uh, the research has indicated that uh, antidepressants are only effective for about 40% of the population. However, for those who do want to explore uh, pharmacological interventions, obviously antidepressants are your first line treatment. You have your SSRIs. These are your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You have your SNRIs, your selective norepinephrine reuptake in inhibitors. And your SNDRIs, selective norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors. What's... Your doctor will help you figure out which one is the best one for you to start out with. A take home point that I think is important for everybody to recognize though is 
when you alter one of these, whether it's serotonin, norepinephrine, or dopamine, it actually does impact all the rest of them. But an SSRI is going to have less impact, less effect on norepinephrine and dopamine than an SNDRI. So it just depends on what the doctor thinks is the best uh, scenario for you. Psilocybin, and some people call this mushrooms, has been shown to be effective for people with treatment-resistant depression with two monitored doses. This is not taking it home. This is not continuous use. This is two in-office monitored doses of psilocybin have been shown to produce lasting antidepressant effects in some people. Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, or, or RTMS, has also been shown to be extremely effective for people with treatment-resistant depression. Now, why do I keep saying treatment-resistant depression? Because these tend to be second and third line options after antidepressants and psychotherapy have failed to help the person achieve um, a full remission. However, Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation is non-invasive. They just put the electrodes on the, on the head. It doesn't involve any sort of surgery or an implantation or anything like that. It is the newer, kinder, gentler um, version, if you will, of what we used to think of as uh, electroconvulsive therapy. Now, ECT still does exist. But uh, RTMS has been shown to be really effective uh, at helping people address their depression. And it can be used as a first-line treatment for somebody, for example, who doesn't want to take SSRIs or, or medications, for somebody who can't tolerate them for some reason. Pregnant women uh, have also been um, studied for RTMS because during certain phases of pregnancy, it is strongly not advised to be on uh, psychotherapeutic medications. So that is something to consider if you've got somebody who can't tolerate or can't be on medication for some reason, uh, RTMS can be a great adjunct to psychotherapy. And I knew people were going to ask about it, so I put it on here. Uh, ketamine IVs may be useful for acute suicidality, but it's not been shown to be effective for long-term antidepressant effects. So if somebody is severely, acutely suicidal, ketamine through the in intravenous methods has been shown to significantly reduce suicidal ideation but it is very short-lived and it's very expensive and it's not something that uh, people are going to want to continue to do continuously uh, so that's where we're at with ketamine right now affective interventions now this is getting more into our wheelhouse as clinicians optimism has been shown to improve mood go figure and that kind of goes along with using uh, dialectics, embracing the good with the bad, and cognitive restructuring, seeing things, seeing the glass as half full instead of half empty, uh, helping people develop a more optimistic and empowered outlook has been shown to significantly reduce depressive symptoms. Well, it makes sense. One of the key features of depression for a lot of people is a sense of feeling helpless and hopeless. Optimism is the opposite of helplessness and hopelessness. Positive psychology interventions, and positive psychology is an entire field, if you will, but interventions like savoring, gratitude, kindness, empathy, strengths awareness, and goal achievement have all been shown to be effective at addressing or helping to address depressive symptoms. Savoring 
is one of those that's kind of unique to positive psychology and it has to do with mindful awareness of the moment savoring the taste of something you're drinking savoring the smell of the ocean air as you walk along the beach savoring the moment can improve people's mood partly because when they're savoring when you savor something it's something you like when you are immersed in something pleasant positive something you like it triggers the release of serotonin and GABA and dopamine and you know those feel-good chemicals it's not going to make you feel great um, like right away but it is one technique that people can use to improve their mindfulness and identify some of the positive things in their life in their environment gratitude they found that people who keep a gratitude journal often have less depression because they recognize some of the things in their life that are going right they also recognize some of the things that suck but they recognize that there are some things going right so it starts balancing out that negative emotional salience in their brain they start seeing the good and the bad kindness kind of similar to gratitude kind of similar to empathy but random acts of kindness being kind to other people has actually been shown to reduce depression when people get out of their own head and they empathize with others and they show them kindness it's been shown to improve their mood strengths awareness is another positive psychology intervention that helps people who feel hopeless and helpless become more aware of what strengths do they have what capacities do they have to help them deal with life on life's terms this again helps them feel safer more empowered less hopeless and helpless and finally goal achievement is obviously helping people learn to set small achievable goals which increases their sense of what what we call self-efficacy or personal power they start realizing hey I can do this a lot of times people set goals that are not really well stated they're kind of vague or they set them that are too big my goal is to get my doctorate well you haven't even started college yet and then they decide along the way that something else comes up and they never achieve their doctorate well if that was the only goal then they may feel bad they may feel like they're not able to achieve their goals if they had set smaller goals incremental goals then they would have had a sense of accomplishment for getting into college for getting their AA for graduating from undergrad those are all much shorter goals that can help people feel like hey when I set my mind to do something I can do it when you set a goal that's too far out there are too many variables that don't even have to do with the person there are too many variables that can intervene that can prevent them from achieving their goal and a lot of times when we fail to achieve our goals we blame ourselves instead of considering what were all the other things that contributed to me not doing that cognitive interventions cognitive behavioral therapy is still the gold standard for addressing depression Um, there is what they call third wave CBT which encompasses dialectical behavior therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy all of these have been shown to be very effective now why might that be because when people are depressed when they're having difficulty concentrating when they're feeling hopeless and helpless when they are in that dysphoric or unhappy mood state their brain notices and pays more attention and perceives things as more threatening or overwhelming than if they were in a a better mood and when they perceive things that way they start thinking 
that you know everywhere I look it seems like it's raining or it seems like the sky is falling which contributes to feelings of hopelessness and helplessness by changing their cognitions and becoming more aware of everything out there and identifying instead of identifying only with what they cannot control identifying what they can control provides a sense of hope and empowerment which is the opposite of hopeless and helpless when people feel more uh, hopeful and empowered it increases positive neurochemicals it decreases cortisol it decreases some of those stress chemicals all of that will contribute to reductions in inflammation and improvements in mood cognitive control training is another intervention that can be used with any of these others including cognitive behavioral therapy but cognitive control training helps people learn to what I call tame their monkey mind cognitive control training in encourages people to for example evaluate the positive you know turn and assess what else is going on you're noticing the bad but what else is going on forcing yourself to look at the big picture instead of having tunnel vision cognitive control training can encourage you to focus on what is in front of you and be more mindful when we're more mindful we which I'm getting down to mindfulness uh when we're more mindful we're more aware of our vulnerabilities and our triggers in the environment vulnerabilities are things that make you more likely to respond with a an extreme response to distress when it comes your way when you're vulnerable when you're tired when you're sick when you're malnourished when you're in pain you probably are more likely to react to something more strongly than if you you would if you were feeling better if you are feeling happier content not in pain well rested so mindfulness is an essential tool for helping to prevent those well, mitigate those vulnerabilities you notice hey I'm tired what do I need to do in order to give myself a buffer so I don't bite somebody's head off today uh, mindfulness also helps you become aware of the triggers in your environment both for distress but also for happiness you can increase the happiness triggers and then you can buffer against or eliminate the distress triggers mindfulness and cognitive control really go hand in hand in some ways it's an aspect of cognitive control training one of the other aspects of cognitive control training is helping people address ruminations and Linehan talks about distress tolerance but cognitive control helps people identify and recognize I don't have to keep thinking about this I can turn my attention and focus on something else which can be empowering to recognize that you don't have to continue to sit there and experience the pain you can turn your attention to something else environmentally and I was really thrilled to see the uh, that there have been a lot of studies on the positive impact of aromatherapy in the environment aromatherapy can be used in a lot of different ways it can be used to stimulate feelings of calm and relaxation stimulate feelings of um, concentration or focus uh, which aromas to use in large part my experience has been depends on the person not everybody is going to smell lavender and find it relaxing uh, so it is partly up to the person the terpenes in the essential oils are what have the significant impact and those terpenes we uh, when we inhale them they activate sensors in our in our nose and in our um, uh, pituitary gland that trigger the release of neurotransmitters 
and, and that's kind of interesting to look at I again I do have another video on on the YouTube channel on aromatherapy if you're looking for a primer there another environmental intervention that I thought was really cool was music medicine especially in people with anxious distress and they differentiated between music therapy and music medicine by the way it was used music therapy is using music in order to accomplish a particular goal working with a therapist to use music to uh, reduce heart rate working with a therapist to use music to accomplish uh, improve concentration for example music medicine is used more like medicine is prescribed where people are encouraged to identify music that can help them feel better you know, what is it that you want to use listen to music that makes you happy listen to music that's energizing listen to music that's cathartic whatever the goal is uh, use that music periodically throughout the day to trigger that emotional response they found that music medicine was more helpful in people with anxious distress as opposed to people who were melancholy or, or extremely sad so that's an interesting thing color therapy was not studied so I'm not recommending it as a an evidence-based intervention but it's something I think we should keep our eye out for because we know that colors influence mood so if I'm sitting in a room and all the walls are black or all the walls are this really depressing cold gray color I'm going to feel differently than if I, I if I'm in a room where the walls are butter yellow or red or orange or something like that so it is interesting but again that's not an evidence-based practice at this point in time light therapy however is an evidence-based practice and this is using bright lights this is not just lights in a room nor is it using just regular old broad spectrum daylight lights although those can be helpful for people light therapy involves choosing broad spectrum daylight bulbs that are extremely intense the higher the further the distance between the light bulb and the person the more the light waves spread out and the less impact it's going to have which is why the light boxes that generally sit on their on their desk or on their table are used as opposed to choosing you know overhead lights however light therapy is very effective in both seasonal and non-seasonal depression thought that was fascinating we've always talked about light therapy in terms of addressing seasonal affective disorder but it has also been shown to be very effective in people with non-seasonal depression this underscores the um, influence of circadian rhythms in the development of even non-seasonal depression light therapy its main goal is to help set those circadian rhythms you do not get vitamin D from light therapy uh, so the only thing it does is help set those circadian rhythms nature therapy is also being studied quite a bit more now which I think is amazing it's absolutely fabulous I do have a video on uh, forest bathing and feng shui that is on the YouTube channel that goes more in depth into it but forest bathing is a tech term for nature therapy where people go out into nature they go out into a park they walk through a na natural area they found that as little as 10 minutes of sitting or walking in a diverse array of natural settings significantly and positively impacted defined psychological and physiological markers of mental well-being it actually reduced cortisol levels reduced blood sugar levels and positively impacted a1c levels 
they found that this can be a variety of things it doesn't have to be a forest it can be a park it can be by a babbling brook it can be a any sort of natural environment where you're not in a building where you're not in the middle of the city um, getting into that natural environment even going to a, a nice wooded you know natural looking park in the middle of New York would give you some benefits maybe not all the benefits because you're still hearing the horns and smelling the smog they found part of the effect of forest bathing is from the terpenes the aromas that are exuded by a lot of the plants but it's also partly due to uh, being in an environment where there's more oxygen plants take in carbon dioxide release oxygen so you're in a more oxygen rich environment and you're separated from theoretically separated from the hustle and bustle of daily life you don't have you know phone calls ringing and all this other extraneous distracting stressful noise another type of nature therapy which has been used extensively both with adolescents as well as older adults and older adults with dementia is horticulture therapy and that's just what it sounds like growing stuff it can be growing flowers planting trees growing vegetables raised garden beds horticulture therapy can even be done uh, with hydroponics they speculate again that part of the benefit is the person feeling like they are able to interact and do something and produce a positive result but also interacting with the plants and which are producing oxygen can can also be very very helpful and relationally I was sad that the research on animal assisted therapy is a very poor quality as of yet uh, animal assisted therapy animal assisted activities and emotional support animals these terms are often used interchangeably in the research so it's really hard to know exactly what effects there are now when you look at the animal assisted research what you see is when animals are involved there tends to be more uh, participation there tends to be less dropout people really like being around animals however animal assisted therapy just like music therapy uses the animal to achieve a particular goal such as using a dog and having someone train the dog in order to learn consistency and assertiveness and uh, emotion management because you know, training a dog can be frustrating sometimes uh, so the animal actually serves as an integral part of of the learning process of the therapeutic process it's not just there to provide comfort it's not just there to provide encouragement for the person animal assisted activities or AAA are activities in which an animal is present like using horses when people are processing trauma sometimes petting a horse can help people feel more secure while they're processing their traumatic uh, memories the horse is very calm and unwavering and doesn't unlike a dog that tends to respond to your emotions quite readily horses tend to be a lot more stoic and can help the person feel more grounded while they're processing traumatic stuff so anyway again animal assisted therapy as of yet doesn't have a significant base of high quality research for the treatment of depression now there is other research for using animal assisted therapy in other situations but for the treatment of depression really is lacking right now likewise communication and relationship skills this is another technique or intervention that is not well studied I guess it's one we just take for granted that we're providing and services 
but a lot of people who feel depressed may have developed that sense of hopelessness and helplessness because they didn't learn to articulate their thoughts, wants, and needs. They didn't learn to communicate what they needed, so they didn't get their needs met, which left them feeling hopeless and helpless. Or they may not have learned how to set and maintain healthy boundaries. So they either have boundaries that are too strong and keep everybody out so they feel isolated, or they have boundaries that are too weak and they feel like people are always invading their space and walking all over them. So communication and relationship skills are tools that are really important in the tre treatment of depression. However, there is, unless I was just using all the wrong keywords, there is very little specific research that ad addresses the impact of communication skills and relationship skills training and depression improvement. And finally, family therapy. Current evidence base is still too heterogeneous and sparse to draw conclusions on the overall effectiveness of family therapy in the treatment of depression. This is according to the Cochrane database which this is another one of those things that there's an entire field of family therapy. We know that family therapy can be really helpful and useful. So why there's not more research looking specifically at the impact of family therapy on depressive symptoms of people in the family is very befuddling to me. Depression represents an imbalance of neurochemicals, either as the direct result of a loss or due to ongoing, unrelenting physical or emotional stress. Effective treatment for depression often requires a variety of interventions to address all of the underlying biopsychosocial issues. 